Hey there, Fro Nation. Jared Poland. Fro knows photo. Here with another Fronos Photo Raw Talk, and this week we're doing it a little different. We've got multi-cameras going to try and capture the interview that we do with Mr. Steve Boyle, who is an amazing sports photographer that's done some crazy, amazing work. I can't say amazing again. I just said it four times. Amazing, amazing, amazing. But he does some great work with sports. Uh, he's done Sports Illustrated stuff. He's assisted. He His college story is amazing. Oh, my God. I just said amazing again, Stephen. I, uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah. His stuff's great. You got to see his work. Go to his website, Google Steve Boyle. Uh, you'll find it. Uh, we have a link over at the website. It's just really, really awesome stuff. So we're going to get to him in a minute. But before that, we've got something else. But I want to let you know, uh, To I want to thank Alan'sCamera.com for supporting the site since day one. If you are in the United States, definitely give them a check first before you uh, reach out to anybody else. Their, their pricing is competitive, uh, if not better than some of the major stores. And you can talk to somebody in real life. Check out Alan'sCamera.com or give them a call, 215-547-2841. And then I want to plug the uh, Fronos Photo Bootcamp Tour. Don't forget about that. Fronosphoto.com slash bootcamps. That's where you can get information on the eight cities that we are stopping in. But now I want to try something different. I'm going to throw something over to Steve here. Steven Eckert. He's a different guy. He's got uh, photo news for us. Steven, welcome to the photo news area and uh, the podcast. Hello there. How, how's it going? So what do we have in the photo news? Got some cool inter interesting things going on. Um, first of all, preview footage of the Blackmagic pocket camera has come out. Uh, the first preview footage. That's that, 4K, right? 4K. Um, and basically it shoots 422 compressed lossless video, essentially. And it's um, with, such a, it's like the size of an iPhone almost. Exactly. It's pretty much the size of your normal iPhone, a pocket camera, a point and shoot, for example. Um, and some cool things about that is that if you're shooting lossless, which is really good if you're editing in Final Cut Pro, stuff like that, um, this will be a lot easier because you won't have to do the transcoding beforehand. You can automatically pop it in Final Cut. It'll be a lot easier. It's better for color grading, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, some preview footage of that is on the website. Uh, you can check that out. Yeah, so guys, go over, uh, click the link below or on the screen if you're here on YouTube. If you're just listening to the podcast, check out fronosphoto.com slash podcast and find episode number 33, and you'll see all of the news articles that we're talking about, including some video and, and other content. What else we got? Uh, some other cool things, uh, a 30-minute video of uh, the world's pretty much largest photo lab. Uh, the Miller Photo Lab has hit the web, and basically it's it's a 30-minute video behind-the-scenes documentary kind of style. And what it is is you can go everywhere from the printing press to see how they make the photo books to to cutting prints, all that kind of stuff. And it's a really good in-depth video if you're interested in, in how the printing behind-the-scenes stuff happens and, and what goes on in photo labs, essentially. Um, and other news, the Kentucky Derby is uh, limiting basically anyone that goes there to bringing in a DSLR camera, anything larger than six inches. So a point and shoot, uh, maybe a DSLR with like a 50 millimeter lens, that'll make it in. But besides press... No, you can't bring a DSLR at all. Oh, you can't bring a DSLR no, at all? No, it's no DSLRs. It's just uh, cameras that do not have detachable lenses that extend six inches or longer. But no DSLRs, even if it's smaller than some of those point and shoots. So if you're a fan going and you know you want to bring your DSLR, that's a no-go unless you're press. Basically. Yeah, they're, wor they're worried about like bombs and stuff. And uh, we, I talked with Steve Boyle about that during the, during the interview as well. Yeah, it's, it's because of the whole Boston bombing thing, which makes sense. It makes total sense. The, the country is on an uprise right now with the whole bombing situation. Yep. And you never know what could happen. So to be safe, they're limiting that right now. Uh, also, Beyonce is banning pretty much every photographer, photo pr photographers, um, press photo pit photographers, I should say, uh, from the photo pit for her whole Miss Carter tour. Mrs. Carter tour, I should say. Um, so basically, if you're trying to shoot a show, if you want to get a press credential for that, you're not going to get it. You're um, not going to get it. She's and, only uh, going to have one photographer, her photographer, on tour that whole time. And basically, they're going to release about three to five images per show. And so. what they're worried about is the uh, the Super Bowl issue that she had with bad photos getting out there. And I talk about this in a video over on the website. You can check it out. It says, uh, it's like, no photographers allowed in the pit. Mm -hmm. And it's about this whole issue. And I see both sides of it. I don't yeah. think she's completely wrong. But I think if you want to limit what gets out there, you don't cut out the professionals from the pit mm -hmm. because now you're just opening yourself up to the crappy photos from the front row that are iPhones and cell phones that aren't going to look as good. And it's basically the amateurs, the, the people that aren't doing their job correctly. They're releasing photos that shouldn't be released. They're screwing everyone over that is a normal press photographer. Well, and it comes down to the, the credibility of a photographer. And I exactly. talk about this in the video is that you as a professional photographer W shouldn't want to release a photo that's not flattering because no. that doesn't look good to the artist, but it definitely makes you look like you're not a great photographer. I mean, I shoot in the pit all the time and there's definitely some unflattering images that I get. I mean, you do it all the time as well. I'm yeah. sure you got to go through and just delete them or put them aside for yourself. And you're not going to release them out to the public. Absolutely. What it's else? It's not professional. 
Uh, and also, the 5D Mark III is going to get the uncompressed uh, HDMI out upgrade, which is supposed to happen on April 30th. You can go to Canon's website uh, and download that. I think it's 1.2.1, the firmware uh, upgrade, essentially. So that's going to let you do what the uh, Nikon's already let you do with the clean video out. Yeah, 422 uncompressed uh, out. So it'll be nice if you're uh, if you have a uh, if you're monitoring it or if you just want uncompressed output. Cool. Yeah, if you have a nice switcher or something that you're setting up for a live feed or. Just something like that. It's a lot better better than your SD output. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Is that it? That's basically it for your photo news for this week. All right, cool. Steven, thank you for bringing us the photo news. Yes, sir. Uh, we're going to work on Steve doing some videos to put up there on photos.com doing a quick maybe minute and a half, two minute uh, look at what the photo news is on the internet or what's going on in, fo- in photography. It's, it's a really good thing to follow because he's pulled some awesome things that he sent my way that are just really interesting topics that I think you guys will be interested in. So Steven, thank you for the photo news. You're welcome. All right. So what we've got coming up right now, we've got Steve Boyle, another Steve, but he's S T E V E Steven over here is S T E P H E N. But Steve Boyle, we got that interview coming up. It's a great, great time. Uh, lots of awesome information for you guys looking to want, who want to know how to get a gig, how to market yourself, how to find your way in, in this world as a photographer that's coming up right now with mr steve boyle and you i call you steve yeah steve is it you got it steve boyle yes sir how you doing today great how are you you know it's funny i'm i'm good no I'm, I'm all right i'm getting better it was an interesting morning today right steven over there yeah i got the thumbs up anyway so we we've, we've met once and it was kind of funny it was like a group of the best photographer best photographers in philly yeah it was pretty cool it was like you me uh, Ben Loiner, yep. some other foreign guy, and Richie Myers. Yep. So anyway, why don't you tell everybody what you shoot? So I shoot a lot of sports, a lot of athletes, portraits, documentary style, um, but definitely stay within the sports and athletes. So you love sports. Growing. You may, I mean, when I first started at 15 shooting the Flyers, I had a season credential to shoot. Um, you just love sports? Uh, yeah, it started in high school, I guess. Just enjoyed it a ton and... I don't know. There's a challenge to it and just stuck with it. And honestly, the more I work in it now, the less I follow it outside of work. Because so it's I, work. Yeah. It's just different. I watch way less on television. It's, it's weird. Are you a but Flyers fan though? Not so much hockey. I never really yeah. got into hockey, oh, baseball, like, football, college. And you like college basketball and stuff. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We're going to look at some of your work a little later. Cause okay. I, I love, well, one, I love the website and two, I just love the photos on the website. And right. that's a lot coming from me. Cause everybody knows I'm pretty critical. All right, um, good especially of sports stuff. But what I love about your stuff is that it's, excuse me, as I burp into the, why don't I just burp into the microphone? I'm sorry. I'm not Howard Stern. Um, no, I'm not. Uh, what I love about your work is that you've got sports, which is something I love or love to capture. And you got the documentary style stuff going all together, but you throw a lot of lighting in there. Is lighting your main thing? Usually. Yeah. Some of the assignments I get, it's just not feasible, but, uh, I come from a documentary background, went to school, studied photojournalism at University of Missouri. So have that to build on and then just kind of taught myself lighting and went from there. Did you, did you, do you think that school was necessary? I think that it's a case by case basis. You can make an argument to go both ways. I tried to do that to my parents. I lost, but. Oh, they made you go. (laughs) Kind of. I'm glad I went. I think what I got out of school more so than the education and that realm of it was how to live on my own. I moved a thousand miles away when I was 18, like how to survive on your own, how to deal with roommates, how to deal with friends, conflicts, things like that. It's just growing up. Right. But, and you could have done that anywhere. Well, yeah. And then, you know, that it is true. It's such a dilemma today. We've talked about this in infinitum on the site uh, or on, on podcasts about who it's for, because it's not for everybody, right. but there are benefits of going to school. Right. Now, when you came out of school, did you assist? Did you knock on somebody's door and they, you just got in? So after I got rejected from every internship that I applied to, hmm. I was like, oh, all right, I'll just move home. I moved home and uh, had met uh, Al Thielman's a Sports Illustrated. I know Al. Al. Man, I go way back with, I met Al when I was like 16 and I shot a Phillies game and he was shooting film and he dropped a roll and then I gave it back to him. Al is, he's a tough cookie. Yeah. You know, let me say something about Al. I'm trying to get Al on this thing too. He um gave me advice that I wasn't old enough at the time to understand that he wasn't being critical of what I was doing. He said to me that it's not easy to make it. Not everybody's going to make it. You may not make it. I took that the wrong way. He was really just saying it like it was yeah he's he's just he's great definitely a straight shooter he's 
been upfront and honest with me um, the the whole time. I assisted him for about a year, and I mean, we traveled the country together. And then it just kind of came a time, and he was like, "Look, man, like you're too ambitious for this. Like, go do your own thing. Like, you know, you, you're not for assisting." I was like, "Okay, I'll figure something out." Kind of half-assed freelance for a little while, was just applying to jobs online, like whatever I could find, and ended up as a photo editor at Runner's World magazine. How'd that happen? I, literally, I applied online. I was down in Atlanta shooting something and they called me and they're like, Hey, we'd like to bring you in for an interview. I had grown my hair out for a year at the time, like total office space kind of interview. I put a suit on, made a nice little resume, put a running photo on the front of it. And I was like, look guys, like, I don't think you're going to find anybody within like 50 miles of Emmaus, Pennsylvania that has like more sports knowledge and expertise in the photo world. So, you know, if I could help you out, you know, gladly. If not, you know, it was nice meeting you guys. And they called me the next day and negotiated my hourly wage up a dollar or two. And I started, I had no idea what I was doing. Well, hey, were you shooting or were you just... I was, you know, sitting behind a desk, like putting together a magazine. And they just hired a new art director. So it was the art director, two freelance designers and myself. So that that was like the intro into starting to get those bigger jobs? I guess, yeah, early on. It was kind of opening my eyes to seeing how jobs are built, the process, how a magazine works. Right. I'm totally glad I did it. It gave me a view from the other side. I now know what photo editors are dealing with and, you know, I can kind of be put in their shoes, you know, but not to the same extent, but a yeah. little glimpse of it. You know, what's cool? going back to the Al Thielman's thing real quick is that he's, I've, uh, he always is open to having assistance. Now he'll stick with assistance for a long time, but he's not afraid to teach somebody what he's doing. Right. I mean, because on his jobs, he has to mold somebody to, to show them exactly what he wants when he wants it. But I, I just, I, I applaud him for taking on young photographers and not being afraid for his, his job. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I feel like that's what it did for me. I was right out of school and he kind of shaped me into kind of what he needed and then realized, you know, a year in like, okay, this is probably not the best. Like, you know, let's get him out there and, you know, find someone else. But I struggle with that same thing when I look for assistance, like, do I want to take somebody out of high school or college and invest the time to shape them and teach them how I want to do things or, you know, some shoots, I just need somebody that knows what they're doing and doesn't need to be taught. So, right. Do you take Richie with you ever? I've taken Richie with me. Sometimes he's trouble. Sometimes he helps out. <laughs> yeah. He's trouble because he packs like 10 bags of clothes and, and 12 bags of shoes for a two day shoot. You, you know, you need to have options. Yeah. That's what he says. Um, what, what was a most fun gig that you did when you were traveling as an assistant? Did you do any Super Bowls? No, not with Al. Um, we had one job where we just, I mean, most of the jobs would come in. It would be Monday morning, and he'd call me and be like, all right, we're going here this week. I'd be like, okay, great. Um, we, I think I just love the travel. Like, I never had traveled that much before in my life, and just bouncing from city to city, like, packing, unloading gear, like, making it all work, making it come together was, was the best part. Sure. So how you, you're at Runner's World. Yep. Uh, you start getting these gigs. I mean, who have you worked for? Like big jobs. Um, ESPN, the magazine. I do some work for Gatorade and their PR team. Um, Bicycling magazine. Still have a relationship with Runners World, though their cha- uh, staff just changed. Um, don't you love when the staff changes and you have to get in with somebody new again? Yeah, starting all over from scratch. It's like you don't know anybody there. Nope. It's like it's who tough. are you? Just send me your portfolio. Be like, yeah, look back at issue twenty three through fifty seven. That's all my work. Yeah, and now they're moving in a different direction and you're out. Mm. So making that jump is is huge. But without that, the whole... So I got in with ESPN from when they moved up to Bristol. Not all of the staff moved from New York to Bristol. And they pulled in um, someone I had been working with at their high school publication. So we had a great relationship already and now it's just And then grown. you start getting gigs from that. Yep. I mean, but that's cool. It's, I, a, it's a small world too. Another interconnected thing. So... As a photo editor at Runner's World, I then trained the photo editor that was above me. And then when I was ready to leave, they hired someone else and I helped that person, you know, take over their job. That guy is now a photo editor at ESPN and we work together there. So, that, so it's that's like, great. It just comes full circle. No, that that's awesome because getting gigs is one of the hardest things to do, especially in sports with having uh, all the leagues are locked down by contracts and 
and NHL owns the rights to every image that's taken unless you're there with a publication and they don't just let anybody in. Right. So how, how did you go about getting credentials? It's just straight through all the, the, the magazines. So early on, I shot some work on spec where I would go to like live event games, cover it. And then those images would be sold later. I would receive, you know, a monthly royalties check. Um, kind of transitioned away from that. Um, I don't remember where I was going with this. What were we talking about? I think we were talking about, I do that all the time. We were talking about, um, I don't know what that, Steven, what were we talking about? You weren't paying attention. Are you playing on your phone again? I think it was more the direction of getting away from the freelance gigs and how you, oh, how you got credentials <laughs> to get into oh, these credentials. things. So I yeah. got, for the live events, I got the credentials, you know, through this agency, they had relationships and they would get me into the things. Sell the images later when that kind of went away, then, I would kind of attend events that didn't require credentials, like the Dad Vale Regatta or mm. like you know, some things like that. Right, because um, that's just open to anybody. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then now it's just if I'm not assigned to something, I'm not. You're not going to go I'm and do gonna, it. Yeah. So when you get, do you just get cold calls now? People just calling you going, hey, we saw your stuff. We want you to come out and shoot this. Yeah. How, how does that happen? Word of mouth, marketing. Um, Website, Google searches, uh, you know, infinite number of ways. What, what are you doing to market what you do to help bring in more jobs, if you want to say? So, I mean, I've met with marketing consultants in the past to do a whole range of things and, you know, try and keep it consistent. But, you know, you got the website, social media, all that, Facebook, Twitter. I've gotten jobs and meetings from, from those sources. Um, I send out uh, quarterly email blasts to anywhere from 1,500 to a few thousand folks and um also quarterly printed mailers like postcards usually so you let the people know that you're alive yep i mean that's what it is you can't just sit back and expect people to show up to your website if you're not going to engage correct i mean that's what people talk about marketing all the time and they want to know that how do you build what you build how did you take frono's photo from zero followers to as many as you have now and it's it's marketing you interact with people. You let them know you're here. You give them a reason to come back. And that's what you're doing with your sports stuff. You let them know, hey, I'm here. By the way, here's the latest stuff that I've done. Yep. Because if you show them, they go, oh, wow, I may need that. I have an assignment coming up. I better give Steve a call. Yep. And that that's great. And I've definitely had instances where someone will email me, you know, maybe I've been sending some promos out for a couple of years. He's like, hey, man, I've had your site bookmarked for like two years. Like I finally got something. I think you'd be great for this. And, you know, that happens enough times and you stay busy. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, so I saw on your site you did the the day in a life. It was it's like a day in a life, but it was one day, one game. Yep. Is that ESPN sends photographers out all over the country? Um, I think that's how it started. It started as they dispatch. It was like one day of coverage, and there were people everywhere. And then I think it morphed into let's put all our resources into one thing. So they'll work with a team or an organization and gain unprecedented access to them. So they'll send in. 10 photographers, you know, 10 writers, the, the all staff one game. to cover one game from sunrise to, yeah. That stuff's angle. all, I mean, I, I pitched the flyers when I was 16, a day in the life of, and this was when I was shooting film and they didn't go for it. I wanted to get on the plane. I wanted the charter jet. I wanted to cover it. It's yeah. what I've done with musicians yeah. because that is, excuse me, that's the lifestyle. That's the real work. Right. When you, when you look at your Ohio state picture, Steven, don't forget to pop up the Ohio state pictures when I talk about them. <laughs> I'm just giving him some notes to go by. Um, <laughs> when I looked at that stuff, it's great from start to finish. You're in the dressing room with the bright red lights. Why yeah. is it red? Is that what they warm up to or something? So it started out, we were in Ohio. They had to get their bags to get on the bus, to get on the plane. We're in there. I don't know. The red lights were on. And then for some reason, all the other ambient lights just went out and it was only these red lights. So it Which just is the came, right color for them. Yeah. It just created this crazy red glow over everything. Which is great. And so that's just, you're, you're in the locker room. Not many people get to go in the locker room. Not yeah. many people get to hear the, uh, the pregame uh, pep talk. Not anybody's on the tour bus, but better than the tour bus is the charter jet. Yeah. That you're on the jet with access to do whatever you want. It's, it's just like Almost Famous. It's just like touring with bands, except you're touring with... Uh, the the uh, the athletes and yeah. they're great and it's probably great to hang out with. It's their lifestyle is so completely different than mine. It's just fascinating. Yeah. Um, and it, it's like a trust and an access that 
you know, ESPN took care of and, you know, they trust me how I act in these situations and they sold the team on this to be able to allow that. And it's just phenomenal. But that's, that's what it's all about is getting the access, but it's the trust. Yep. If people can trust in what you do and they look at your work and, and they see that, you know, the work's great and your ethic is great. Because I know when, when touring with bands, you're surrounded by drugs and alcohol. Uh, if you start imbibing in that, I mean, that's what they did in the 60s and 70s. Well, in the 70s, everybody was doing coke off the guitar and the, the hooker and the just don't use a razor blade. Um, you know, that's what they were doing. I never done that on the road. I just go on the road and I do my job. Yeah. I'm there to shoot. And if everybody's getting drunk, I'm taking pictures of what's going on. So you don't want to you don't want to be a part of the party. Right. Then you get lost. And that's kind of what I where I you know, bring what I learned in school from that, you know, doing documentary projects, you know, there's tons of different approaches to it. You know, some situations require a fly on the wall kind of technique. Sometimes you, you kind of need to engage in the subject only to then pull back. Like there's, you yeah. Know. And what I've noticed about your work on your site is that it covers it all. You've got all the lighting down, then you've got the documentary style stuff down. You've got everything. Are there a lot of composites? I'm, I'm, I wanted to ask you that about the site. Are there composites that you do? No, I would say, I mean, I'm trying to think what's on the site. There might be something where, let's say, I, maybe I burned in a little more sky right, but than that, was actually yeah, there, but okay. I'm not, you know, I'm not really switching heads, body parts, doing things like what that. What about different backgrounds and then cutting that in later? That's no. Not, so the stuff that you have there is, you it, just, you, you call yourself an editor as well, photo editor. I mean, I started there, yeah. I mean, the, the, the processing, the processing, the shots. Do you do it, you have a certain style that's yours? Uh, a little bit, yeah. I use I just switch retouchers, so that's maybe changed a little so bit. So you send thing. your stuff out? I do now, yes. Um, Are they all raw? See, that, that's a question. Number one question on my list, and I don't like doing questions, is sports shooters, there's two things that they do. Primarily, they shoot JPEG, and they crop the shit out of their work. Right. I think that applies more towards, like, game coverage kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe newspaper guys. Like, you can get away with more in a newspaper. You, right. You can't run a two page spread. Well, maybe now you can in a magazine off, yeah. off a JPEG that's cropped in 80%. Um, but yeah, I mean, I shoot raw like hundred percent of the time on your Canon. You have a one DX yet? Uh, no, but that's about to replace my Mark four. Yeah. It's going to be nice. I hear the one DX is pretty damn good. I've rented it a bunch of times and it's phenomenal. It is that good. Yeah. How did, how did you, the, the question everybody always wants to know is how did you end up with a Canon versus an Nikon? I think it just, let's see. Because Al switched, Al's on Nikon again, yeah. right? He's on a D4 once that all happened. Yeah, he switched after I uh, was working with him. But uh, let's see, my first camera was my dad's old camera, which was a Pentax something or other. And then I guess, you know, for a birthday or Christmas or something, my parents got me a Canon EOS Elan 2E, I think. I had an EOS Elan was my first it had SLR. The, it had the eye the, recognition yeah, thing. Look, you see my eye shaking? <laughs> that wouldn't work for me. My eyes just do that all day long. Um, but yeah, and then I just stuck with it. And I mean, at this point, it's just, you have to, I, I don't want to go through the process of rebuying everything and relearning, right. switching how, every, how I do everything. And it doesn't, you could shoot, if somebody handed you a D4 tomorrow and you had to figure out how to do it, you'd be able to do it without a problem. Yeah. You know, I, it's, so the cropping thing, I noticed that I bought the, the Sports Illustrated put out a really cool book years ago. Maybe it wasn't that long ago, but it was the full frame image and then the image that went in the magazine. Yeah. So it's this really big hardback book and you see the guy running up the middle of the football field and you're like, oh, that's great. Tight shot. And then you get to see the slide and he's like this minuscule person. And you're like, oh, my God, they crop. Because when I started with sports, I didn't know anything about cropping. All I learned in school was crop in the camera, not in the dark room. Yeah. Because as you raise the enlarger, you start to run into grain and noise. So uh, noise, <laughs> it wasn't noise, it was grain. Um, so that I thought that the way you shoot was you get it right in the camera in terms of composition. Little did I know that most of the people that were shooting sports shoot loose and then they crop the hell out of it. Yeah. I still kind of abide by get it right in the camera first. Whereas, you know, I'm not relying on the computer to like create the final image. Um, but when you do go down that road, it opens up a whole new set of possibilities. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, there's just a ton of different ways to do it. You can shoot loose and crop in later, or you can sit on the you know side of a basketball court with a 400 and see what mm. happens. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I saw you, you were at the Super Bowl this year? I was, just as a fan, though. Oh. Um, not, not covering it. That's no fun. Yeah. Do you bring a camera? No. Just because you're not, when you're working, you're not shooting. Yeah. I mean... When you're not working, you're not when, shooting. Correct. Basically. I was in town for work 
And then my work obligations ended on Friday. So I had Saturday and Sunday to enjoy myself. Right. What do you shoot in your downtime? Uh, I don't shoot too much stuff in my downtime. It's more catching up from the non downtime. Um, I definitely want to try and get, you know, some more stock shoots happening and have some ideas in the back of my head that, you know, need some production and time thrown at them before they come to fruition. So when you're shooting just for yourself, you do, do you end up putting that stuff on the site to help promote what you're doing? Sometimes. Yeah. I tend to, honestly, I don't shoot as much for myself as I'd like to. It's always like there's a goal in mind or intention. Yeah. Like if I'm going to go out there, if I'm going to spend the money on whatever, I should be making something back for this. So it's the, what, what do you like to shoot for fun? If you were shooting for fun, I don't know. I, I, I guess I would kind of think of whatever's on my iPhone as kind of uh, what I shoot for fun. I got you. And it's just like, you know, whatever I see in my travels, like just weird stuff. Like, uh, I'm trying to think like we were in, I was in, uh, Germany for this totally separate, weird corporate job. And, in the middle of a park in Munich, there's a wave and everyone surfs it. Like an actual water wave? Yeah. There's like a, uh, it's kind of like a natural lazy river. I don't know how natural it is, but there's a wave and people surf it all day long. Just Ooh. weird stuff like that. Like discovering weird things that I didn't know about and, and shoot it. No, that's, that's really cool. But you know, it's, it only lives on my phone. So is there, is there something that you want to shoot that you haven't shot yet? Um, I like to get into more commercial work for the apparel companies that kind of work with sports. I do some work for Gatorade, but not on their, you know, commercial level. Um, you know, Nike, Adidas, Reebok, things like that. Just kind of what's your foot. I mean, how are you going to, what's your foot? How, <laughs> how are you going to get your foot in the door for that? Uh, it's just same thing through marketing. I do portfolio reviews, try and make connections, you know, hit people up that I know to network like, Oh, you know, someone up here or maybe someone changes jobs and finally they're at a company that has this account. It's right. Just keep it on top of things. And that's the, that's the thing we have to do as photographers. You have to be on top of the game. People again, ask all the time, how do you get jobs? How do you get out there? I mean, well, you get out there, you make connections. Something's going to happen. You can't just sit by idly and expect somebody to call you out of the blue. Right. That will happen when you put in enough work. Right. When you put in that work and you reach out to the right people and you're seen in the right circles and you're putting you, you, your stuff's in a magazine, your stuff's online, people are going to see it and they're going to recognize you and then they're going to call you when they need you. Right. But you can't just sit back. Right. You have to be proactive about it, definitely. Absolutely. So I noticed that... Um, we talked about this in the news earlier that Churchill Downs is saying that nobody can bring a camera in. Yeah. Non-professionals yesterday. Yeah. What, what do you think? I mean, it's like cameras, DSLRs can't come in. So they, they specify it broadly as cameras that lenses can come off of, but if your camera only extends six inches, a lens is six inches, you can bring it in. I mean, what do you, what do you think about this? It I doesn't mean, affect what you do. It but. doesn't affect the media. Um, it just affects the fans. Again, I don't know the the security behind it all like i don't know if you know whatever the certain they, amount you know, of they, explosives are they, they're worried that somebody's going to use a blow up a camera which they did back uh in afghanistan back in the day they walked in as a, a film crew and the camera blew up and killed the guy okay i mean i don't know but based on what just happened in boston i think you know nothing's going to be the same everyone's going to be just like after 9-11, everyone, everything's overly cautious for a little while, and then it just kind of slowly eases back. See, my thing is, like, if you're coming to the... You don't... You're not paid to do the job. I'm not saying you shouldn't be there as an amateur taking photos. You're not going to walk into a gig anywhere, and this is for the past 10 years or even more, with a professional-level camera and your 70 to 200 or your 300 2.8. You're not going to walk in, and they're not going to let you in. You know? So I don't really see the need for having the... I mean, I, I don't know... I don't, I don't see a big deal. If you want to carry your digital SLR and, and take pictures of just what's going on, then that's fine. But they're mostly just snapshots. It, does, it doesn't right. affect the professionals doing the gig. Right. Now, I saw, I saw a picture you took of a horse. Yeah. What, tell me about that shoot. That was a story about this horse named Struck It Lucky. And it was a story for ESPN, the magazine. Um, I think what they did was follow... I'm trying to remember the details. They followed a horse from birth in the auction block to, you know, training and his first races and just kind of the whole process, what that's like, you know, the investment that goes into this and the research behind it and, you know, the success at the end. Um, and I was kind of brought in later in the story for a day of 
training with the horse and then his first race. Um, he ended up winning his first race wow. and it was great. So I mean, that, that tight shot, I mean, you have all the veins, yeah. you've got the nostrils are flared, letting in a lot of, uh, oxygen. Yeah. How was that crop? I mean, I'm sure that was cropped a little bit to, it wasn't cropped too much. Magazine. It was shot with a 400 to eight from the edge of a track during, uh, warm ups or workouts. So I was maybe, I don't know, 50 yards. 30 yards. I mean, it's a tight shot. I mean, it's the head and a little bit of, yeah. you barely have the jockey in there. It's a fantastic shot. There could have been an extender on there. I don't recall. Wow. But yeah, I mean, not, not, you know, it wasn't the whole horse and then it's cropped in. Right. Definitely not. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's sharp as can be. And it looks, I mean, the veins are incredible in that. Yeah. So what gear do you take on a shoot? Like what's your bag look like? Or um, multiple bags. Yeah. Multiple bags, depending on the shoot. I would say the bag that always comes with me is it's a think tank international roller. You want me to list off everything in there? So it's got 5D Mark III with a grip. Currently it has a 1D Mark IV, which I hope to soon replace with an X or 1DX. Okay. Two cameras. Um, and then lenses 16 to 35, 2.8, 35, 1, 4, 50, 1, 2, 85, 1, 2. 24 to 70, 2 8, 24 to 105, F4, 7200, 2 8. Uh, How about the big glass? Don't usually take that. I just have a 400 um, for that. I just have a 400, you know, 400 I mean, 2 8 when I need it. I bought that a while. I, that's Al's old lens. I've had that for a while. Um, what else is in the bag? Whole slew of cards, a flash, quantum battery for the flash. And when you're doing Chargers. lighting, what, what strobes do you use? Uh, currently, I work with Einstein lights. I love the Einstein. I have six of those and then a whole slew of stands and modifiers for those. And then you said you, you taught yourself lighting. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, if I go back to one of the first assignments, I shot portraits. It's terrible. It was one. I rented it from Calumet. My dad was my assistant, and it was like one softbox. Just... It, I'm shocked at how far I've come from there to now. And it just happens because you get out there and you shoot. Yeah. I, I was lucky. I was um, this ESPN's high school. Um, what well, wasn't then it was called school sports when I was in school, then it changed its name to rise and then ESPN bought it. And it was ESPN high school, but it was a direct to high school distributed magazine. And I was kind of their Philly guy, but that meant like Philly, New Jersey, New York, like DC. So yeah. they kept me busy and that's kind of how I learned lighting. I was just, Lucky enough to get into that. Actually, my college roommate shot for them in D.C. sometimes, and he passed my name along. So that's, that's, it all it's, comes around. Yeah, the people you meet. No, <laughs> yep. in school, what, was this a large school? I've, I've never... Missouri's about... It's kind of like the Penn State of Missouri, of Missouri. So they have big sports teams? Yeah, Division so, One. Um, when I was looking at colleges, and Al waited on this decision for me too, uh, for me it came down to between Syracuse and Missouri. And Syracuse, it's up 300 gray days a year. Right. It is Division One, but all their sports are played inside. And right. And there's no light inside. Right. So Missouri's outside, photojournalism, which is more of what I wanted as opposed to communications. I just got chills. <laughs> I just got chills, man, because that that's... If I ever went to a four-year school, it would have been to a huge-ass school to shoot... But you have access for four years to... Perf- basically professional athletes right you have gear they may give you gear to shoot i mean you, and you get in with these guys now yeah it's unbelievable it's kind of crazy how I, so for four years when i was in college my job was to work for the athletic department and i covered all 27 sports but th- how i got that job was the summer before i went to school i was like okay this is what i want to do when i get there i just emailed the athletic director a few weeks later, he emailed me back. I have no idea why. This guy's super busy. But that's what and you he's do. Like, yeah, he's like, hey, email this guy. So as soon as I got to campus, I met with them. Yeah. You, you want it, you go and get it. Yep. I mean, everybody knows, you don't know Sam Green, because he's a kid in college right now, that I, I helped. I think he may have asked me to help him with a portfolio to go into college with. And he's from Pittsburgh, and he hate, and he loves the Penguins. Screw Sidney Crosby. Um, I hate Sidney Crosby. That baby. Such a whiner. Um but he asked me to help. So we ended up making four videos. He showed me his work. I sent him out on assignment and said, go do this, this, and this. Then I said, pick your work. And then, and the reason I say this is Sam is a freaking go-getter and Sam, don't take this to like, 
mean that you can do anything you want now. All right. Uh, you can't knock on my door at two in the morning. No, but but Sam is making things happen. He makes calls. He called Dominic Episcopo. You know Dom yeah. Episcopo? No, the, the name. Church. Never met him. He's got the church. He's been on Raw Talk. He called him because he needed to do an architecture shoot, and he knew from one of the Raw Talks that he has a church. So Dom told me that he he's a persistent guy, which means that he must have sent like five emails or, or whatever, but he's getting in. He's making his way now from in college. Yeah. He's a first-year college student. He's a freshman, and he's starting to make things happen. You're not going to win every time, right. but... You know, what you did is reach out to the right people. What do they have? They didn't pay you to shoot or did they pay you to nope, shoot? Yeah, I got paid. Really? Yep. So you're you're a college kid, thousand miles away from home, getting paid to shoot sports and learn and, and hone your skills. Yep. That it, 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 and did you, did you hit on any volleyball girls? Too tall for me. They're too no. tall. When you're tall, you're like six, <laughs> three. No. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think softball girls. Cause they're a little shorter. There was one softball girl that was cute. I, I did just a, one. The <laughs> others just played for both teams. Uh, <laughs> I did a photo story on her my senior year, so that worked out. See, it got, it got, it got you dates. She had a boyfriend, but we hung out. Exactly. <laughs> it got you dates because your boyfriend lived a thousand miles away. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's fantastic. And and, and I, I think there was a, another guy on the site who went to another college. And I'm just like, look, get in with the newspaper. And he became the editor of the newspaper the next semester yep. because he was doing a great job. He had all the gear from school. Did they give you gear? Uh, no, I supplied that on myself. And then I switched to digital kind of on my own dime. So you were, you were shooting film then? Well, what year? Because I don't even know how this, old you are. Uh, 2000. Fall of 2000 is when I started. So you're born just, like 84. No, just 82. Just turned no, 31. It's really. You look young, man. <sighs> Thanks. Um, I, I guess, wait, summer of, summer of 2003, I switched to digital. Um, what was your first body there? A, a one, EOS 1D. 1D. It was just a 1D, right? Yeah, the sunk was 4.1. 4, one. four some me megapixels, it synced at 500th of a second. Yeah, that was that killer camera. Anyway, I went in there and was like, hey guys, I just saved you a crap ton of money. Like, can you, you know, can I get a raise or something? So... Uh, I just doubled my salary by doing that, saving that money and put more money Can in my pocket. Can I ask what they were paying a college kid? I got paid, I think it was, it started at $10 an hour. So it was hourly. Hmm. It was, you know, I mean, looking back on it, there's worse deals out there. Yeah. But I was, you know, $10 an hour. So if I show up to the game three hours early, oh, you know, you got to get there three hours early. And then it takes, you know, an hour or two to clean up. I don't know. That's I cool. guess that was like, I don't know, six, seven six, hours at yeah. a game and doing something you love. Yeah. And when you were shooting film, did you, were, was it black and white? Was it color? Were you processing it yourself? For the university, it was color. I'm pretty sure it was always color negative. They processed it. And I never really saw too much of that. They just kind of had it scanned and like, right. Put so it you in just handed guide. everything over. Yeah. Um, but for school stuff, the whole gamut of things, black and white, color slide, color negative, everything. Um, and then, uh, let's see, one of the classes that we took was a staff photojournalism class where, so there's two papers in Columbia, Missouri. One is owned privately and one is owned by the school. And the one owned by the school is run by professors, students and everything. That's so great. your class is work at the newspaper. So that was my first hands-on learning yeah uh foray into digital um on that front but yeah i haven't looked back since yeah i mean it's it's fantastic to have those opportunities and, and what i tell people is when you go to a college like that you have access to the deans you have access to the business people you're making connections with people that are going to be professionals right. and the alumni have you gotten anything out of any alumni yep i mean so some of my um, missouri's journalism school has when I went there, it had five sequences. There was photojournalism, uh, broadcast, magazine, writing, newspaper, and oh God, I don't know the other one. But anyway, all those people that are still in the field, you know, magazine writing. Okay, someone works at some magazine in New York. You just reach out and, hey, I'm a hey, you know, do you know the photo editor? Hey, can you just, you know, put us in touch, whatever. Just, yeah. And so then, the, uh, the moral of the story is connections, connections, connections. Yep. 
That's that's awesome. So wh- what what do you want to shoot next? What is something that is on your to do list? Um, I'd like to you know continue doing work with ESPN. Like they always have great things going on. The one day one game series is just a great thing to be a part of. Hopefully, you know, they'll bring me in for the next one. Um, want to shoot, you know, commercial stuff for the, for the clients. Right. Um, I did ask that trying to tiptoe into video stuff. Yeah. The, the, the cross platform. What, what are you doing with that? Currently not too much. Uh, I was just out in LA, um, to stay with my buddy, Sean Corgan, who I think, you know, yeah, I'm, it, Sean's <laughs> got to come on. That, that had to be fun. Were you up to like four every morning? Uh, nah, not too late. We, we Cause Sean doing. has a way, right? Sean is like the ultimate just dude. I think everybody loves Sean. Yeah, he's and a great he just guy. attracts cool people. Yeah, he just fits that LA scene really staying well. At, staying at his house, there's just always somebody kind of re- coming through the revolving door, and they're always interesting people. Um, but anyway, we co-directed. I helped him, whatever, um, create this video for one of the guys from Big Time Rush. Mm-hmm. Just he wanted to do a little side project, so. He rented some gear. We got, you know, a small crew together and, you know, took over this guy's house. And, you know, he let me direct a couple shots, you know, play with the lighting, whatever. Um, that's kind of my first touch into video. Um, would like to do more of it, but it's kind of a thing where I don't want to share what I'm doing related to that until I can do it well. Right. So, you know, some people ask me a portfolio reviews, Oh, you shouldn't emotion. You should, you know, yeah, like a very little bit, but I'm not ready to share that. You know, that's going to be the, I mean, that is the next step, right. To be able to do all of it. But the problem, the, the dilemma is you do not want to miss those images, the still images, right. Still images are still strong. Yeah. I mean, you can watch like we look at the Boston bombing and you see, the still image of the guy on the ground, yep. the runner, the 70 some year old guy with the, then you got the police with her gun out and you got the other two running. We've seen that video. The video makes an impact, mm-hmm. but that still frame just opens the mind up to, to try to figure out what's going on. And that's why I don't think still images are going to go away. You just have video mixed with stills, right. but you just, when you're, when you're shooting, you can't be like, Oh, I'm going to do video for this minute. And then I'm going to shoot a photo because you end up missing everything. Right. You just have to go in with the mentality of now I'm here to capture video. Exactly. So I, it hasn't come up for me yet, but I would sell someone on, you need two different people doing these things. Then you can bring the crew in. Right. Unless it's something like a a how to work out, like how to, you know, ab workout, leg workout, you know, shot on white. This is how you do the exercise and video. Here's a still for the magazine. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and, or you have the two days, like one day we do video or first four hours we do video and the next four hours we do the photos and we get everything that you need. Right. It's just, it, and the one DX is going to be, oh, you have a 5D Mark III, so you can do video with that thing. Yep. You know, I know Steven's got one of those too. I've got all the Nikons. I'm debating getting some 5D Mark III's just for video though. But then I have two systems. I've got all, I've got to get the same gear, but I want to be multi-system. I want to be able to shoot with anything. Um, I would love to, I'm going to think I'm going to go to borrow lenses and borrow a 1DX. They're I think they're going to send me that out. 1DX and a 70 to 200 2.8. Yeah. I think I want the Hebrew Trinity, the 16 the 16 to 35, 24 to 70, 70 to 200 on a 1DX. They're going to send it out and I'm just going to go shoot with it. I just want to feel what it's like. I'm curious how the new 7 or 24 to 70 is. I haven't touched that yet. The version 2? Yeah. It's supposed to be sharper. It's supposed to be lighter, it's supposed to be, yeah. Well, it, it's as narrow. It's like a 24 to 70 on the on the Nikon, which is on that lens over there. Smaller. It's, it's much narrower, but it's better. I know that the problem with the first one, and they told me this um, at the store, the camera store, is that it's, it has a plastic inside on the version one, and okay. over time it starts to warp, which causes your images to not be sharp, and that's the difference between that lens and, and like a Leica or something. Yeah. I'm so not saying that the Nikons would be better. They're all They all have issues, but... Yeah, well, they probably did a much better job with this new lens. Yeah, no, I don't like plastic. No, you know what lens you would love <laughs> if they made it? 14 to 24. Yeah, the two, 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 eight throughout or oh, like yeah. two. Oh, yeah, two. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's... They have... Uh, what's, what's your dream lens? Uh, I don't know. I played with the 800 5.6, which is pretty nice. I kind of wish it was F4, though. Um. The eight, the Canon eight to fifteen, is that what it is? It's a fisheye. Yeah, but it's f four. Yeah, I wish that was two eight. But do you really need it when it's that wide? Do you really need the uh, the the two eight? So the f- one of the first times I used it, I mounted it in the ceiling of a high school football locker room inside, and it was dark. Like 
I'm not. I can't strobe that, or I didn't strobe. But you it. got a five D Mark III that shoots at astronomical ISOs, and the one DX can do the same thing. Right. So you set it at like thirty two hundred, four thousand, but you put that two pages in a magazine, it's not going to look that great. Well, if you shot a Nikon D four, it would. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just busting on you. I, I hear what you're saying. I, I am a two point eight or better type of shooter as well. I mean, Sigma just put out the uh, announced an eighteen to thirty five one eight zoom, yeah. but that's DX. Well. A EFS. It's not a full frame lens. Okay. It's it's you know we'll see what happens. I mean, Canon's got that two hundred one eight. Back yeah. in the day, they had that two hundred one eight. Great lens. And that was a fantastic piece of glass. They took that off the market because it had too much lead in it. If you knew that, the glass had too much lead made in it, so it had environmental issues for for the times that you eat your lens. Because how many times are you going to eat that? <laughs> you know. Yeah, that was a great lens. Yeah. Um. I'm trying to think. I've never played with the Canon 1200. Um, the 1200 millimeter it, lens. Yeah. I, five, six, or eight. I forget what it is. That stuff's insane. Just imagine going out to a, a, a game. I mean, you have to go out with an idea of what you want to shoot. Right. Because it's not the easiest thing to wield around. No, it's great for shooting baseball from center field or from the outfield. Oh, snap. Do you do you set up at, at baseball games with the, wire, the remote cameras, and every time you take a picture, it... From one camera, it triggers every other one? Uh, so the last time I covered a baseball game was the Washington Nationals. I had an assistant with me, and we ran. I had two cameras on me and three remotes. So I think he was in charge of firing the remotes. Um, n- not my camera, but yeah. That's, do, you, do, you, do you consider it cheating or just part of how you have to capture multiple angles at, one, at a game? I think in a sport where the action is in a predictable location, it's just a smarter way to cover it. Like you can't really cover soccer or rugby in that manner. You know, there's action near a goal. Okay. But with baseball, there's action at the plates and everything else you can handhold, you know, for the other spots on the field. It's just the the toughest with with baseball is you never know when the shortstop's going to dive in the hole because exactly you don't know where the ball is going to be hit. Baseball's tough. Baseball is really tough. And Tealman's has a bunch of those. I mean, Al's a great baseball photographer. Yep. He's just a great photographer all the way around. But just looking at some of those those shots of you you have to anticipate. You have to know the game, and that's true with anything. If you're shooting sports, you have to know the sport you're shooting, right? Because you have to have an understanding that if it's three and zero. Oh, don't waste frames. Now it doesn't matter as much now, but back when you shot film three and oh, you're probably not shooting photos because you know, they're most likely taking, right? But it's just like what to focus on. Yeah. That's the hardest thing. How do you, how do you decide what to focus on? Is it based off of the player that's up or just the combination of things? I don't really put too much thought in it. I just, it's just kind of, I guess, instinct or kind of what I do. Um, you definitely need to know player tendencies. Yeah. Um, and that's sometimes tough for someone that, you know, I just came into town to shoot three Nationals games. I hadn't shot the Nationals ever before. I haven't, you know, I don't know all these player tendencies, whereas maybe the team photographer has everything down. So it's just, you know, that's a challenge. Do you know Miles Kennedy? Um, I just know the name. Yeah. You know Rusty? Yep, I met him back when I was assistant for Al. Oh, yeah, yeah, because they all, they all went together. Rusty, Rusty's an awesome guy. I'm still trying to get him on, too. I got to get Al on. So can you send Al a message and be like, hey, I just did Raw Talk. You should come on. I do day. need to send him an email. I haven't talked to him in a few years. That's been um, that long? Yeah. Uh, I've been busy. He's been busy. But uh, yeah, I'll definitely Yeah, he's been busy him. shooting Super Bowl covers. Yeah. You know, that's cool. That's good stuff. All right. Uh, let everybody know what your website is. Uh, it's just steveboylephoto.com. It's a kick-ass website. It's, uh, it's fantastic. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to pay for it. I know a bunch of people use that and it, and it it's a photo folio yep. is what they use. It's like a thousand bucks to get in the gate and then 17 bucks a month. But the quality that it translates, it's HTML five across the iPhone, the iPad. It's fantastic. Full frame shots. It, that website design helps you get gigs. Doesn't it? Uh, I think just having a clean, easily nav- navigatable, navigatable website yep. uh, helps. And it's so customizable that it's, you know, you could have the same website from them and have a totally different look to it. So yeah. it just, you know, it's versatile. It's all about clean and easy. That That's where it's at with the photos. So any anything else you want to leave us with? 
Not that I can think of. You have any more questions for me? Uh, my list is, it was the raw JPEG. It was the cropping. It was just having a conversation. I found it interesting about the, the college. The college thing, going, going there, uh, they still have a good program? Photojournalism, yep. It's a one, tough one field, of, man. One of the best, yeah. What do you have to say for people out there trying to get gigs and, and just trying to come up? I think if you want to do it, you'll find a way. And I can't add more. I think I should just stop there because that's, you just have to do it. You have to find a way to make it happen. We all find our way and, and it, there's a door that opens. There's a door that closes. You have to find a way to make that happen. And, and I think you've done a great job at that, Steve. Yeah, I can go. Uh, one of my stories that my girlfriend hates when I tell is, you know, I wasn't always busy. I wasn't always working a ton. So I don't know what, what year this was, but, you know, I had no money. Maybe I was living at home. I would do whatever I could to get money. Medical research studies market research studies, mm -hmm. you know, a neighbor needed me to drive to Maryland to pick up like flooring tiles, like whatever it takes. So you have to fund your, your passion by doing, then I say this with like weddings. Do yeah. You, have you done weddings? I did one wedding, which a friend would not leave me alone about shooting her wedding. I did one wedding. You probably do a great job, Adam. I don't want to do another one. No, but you, I bet you did a great job. I don't know. She was happy with the photos. That's all that matters. I sweated my ass off and, you know, <laughs> just worked super hard. More it's so just, than when you shoot games. It, it's a challenge. It's it is a challenge. A challenge. But the, I think I think we'll leave it at that. If you want something, you got to beat the crap out of it until you get it. Mm -hmm. All right, Steve. Thank you for joining us, man. No problem. And uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to do a, do do a sign out. All right. Thank you guys for listening here on Frono's Photo Raw Talk. Jared Poland, fronosphoto.com. See ya. So there you guys have it. We did it a little different this week. If you're on YouTube, you've seen the multi-angles cut together. Really good. Hope you enjoyed the interview with Steve Boyle. Hope you enjoyed the, the photo news at the very beginning from Steven Eckert over here. Uh, I love the photo news, and I can't wait to bring you guys more of it. But yeah, want to thank AlansCamera.com for all of their support. Thank you to BBO Poker Tables. They're the guys who make the poker tables like this. I did buy this table, guys. So I did buy it. They didn't give it to me for free. Uh, I, I would have liked it for free, but it, it didn't happen. Adorama Picks, big thank you to those guys. Oh, and coming up, I, I got some photo news. I know we're at the end, but it's not really photo news. You know, that Rode microphone that it's wide, well, it plugs into your iPhone and then you sync it later with any camera. They, they sent, they're sending me one. Nice. So I'm going to do a review of this Rode microphone and, and, yeah, I can't wait to, to make it happen. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and sign out again, even though I already did it. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Don't forget to go to iTunes and hit the subscribe button because we give the, the uh, we release the new Raw Talks every Monday at noon. Well, when we put new ones up, they come up at Monday at noon, and then we don't release them to the public until Tuesday. So you can get an early listen, an early download to get a jump on the week for a Raw Talk and maybe even catch some uh, contests that I run for only people that have been subscribers. Uh, so that's that's about it for Raw Talk. This is episode number 33, Jared Polin, Photo.com. See ya.